Hey everyone, this is Joe. I am the Digital Astronomer and I want to thank you for tuning into my channel. This week we're going to focus on Messier 101, the Pinwheel Galaxy. This is an absolutely gorgeous uh, spiral galaxy. Um, it's an object that I go back to almost every year to at least observe. Last year I did photograph it. In fact, this is the picture that I captured last year, but I've wanted to do better. I knew that I could get a better picture because I'm using a little bit better equipment and I know a lot more. I'm, I, my technique has improved a lot over the last year. So I wanted to go back and really focus a couple of nights on the uh, Pinwheel Galaxy. And I've captured about eight Eight hours of total data and I think the I think the finished product is incredible so in this video I'm going to do a couple of things first of all I want to take a moment and I want to show you where we can find this in the night sky and I'll tell you a little bit of the basic information about M101 then we're going to go over and I want to show you how I captured it using Nina. Now this is not going to be a complete tutorial on Nina, but rather I just want to give you a little glimpse of how I set up my sequence and then I want to show you a couple of features of Nina that have been very helpful to me as an astrophotographer. And again, Nina is a free piece of software. You can download it, start using it. It does have a little bit of a learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, you're absolutely going to love it. And of course, I want to show you the final image, and I want to compare that to what I did last year, and I hope that you're going to see that I've made some big improvement in my astrophotography over just a one-year span. And I hope that will serve to encourage you. Stick around, we're going to look at M101, the Pinwheel Galaxy, right after this. Okay, as always, I'd like to take a couple of moments to show you here in Stellarium how to find this object and to tell you a little bit about the history of its observation. If you're not interested in this, you can fast forward to the next session if you want and where I'll show you how I captured it and then course the final section where we get into more depth about the picture itself but uh, I want to tell you a little bit about this object and how it was discovered if you notice here first of all we are looking towards the um, northern sky here is the uh, Ursa Major the the Big Dipper and if you find the handle of the Big Dipper and you kind of find where this curve in the handle right here is the star Miser and if you work your way a little to the east, you will come across the Pinwheel Galaxy. Now, this was a galaxy that was first observed in 1781 by Pierre Méchon. Here's a picture of Méchon if you'd like to see him. He was working with Charles Messier on uh, Messier's catalog. And if you remember, Ca Messier's catalog is a catalog of things that are not comets. And so Méchon recognized it, and in his notebook, he, he described it as a nebula without stars, very obscure and large. Now, later on, William Parsons, better known as Lord Ross, using his 72-inch reflector named Leviathan, was able to resolve the spiral structure in this galaxy. And from that point on, this became one of the favorite objects for astronomers and astrophotographers to look at and to observe. It is a classic example of a spiral galaxy, and we have the advantage, because we're looking at it face on, of being able to see it's beautiful, although a little bit asymmetrical um, um, structure. And we'll talk about that asymmetry a little bit later and why it's there. But first, let's go over and take a moment and look at how I captured this using the free astrophotography uh, program called NINA. Okay, you can see here I've got Nina started up, and um, right now it's doing my autofocus. I am shooting uh, Messier 101, the pinwheel galaxy, and uh, down here in my sequence information right here, you'll see that I'm shooting uh, 300 second subs, which are five minute subs, 
I'm going to shoot a total of 72 of them at gain 140 with a one by one binning. Um, I've already slewed over to the target and got it centered. You really can't see it very good, I'm sure, uh, in the video, but I can see it just slightly here. Um, right now, I'm running through, uh, Nina is running through the autofocus sequence, and I've got a couple of more uh, minutes to go on it. It's going to take a few more shots, but you can see it's getting its, uh, its curve set up here. If you'll take a look at my guiding, my guiding is excellent. Um, my total RMS air right now is uh, uh, 0 0.11. It was 1.2. I'm hoping it's going to stick around like that most of the night. I will have about an 80% moon coming up um, later on. I think it comes up around uh, 12.45 or so um, tomorrow morning. So I'm going to have uh, several hours to shoot uh, before I get up there, probably about three hours before I get to the moon coming up. But even there, I'm going to be shooting kind of away from the moon. So I'm hoping it will come out fine. <coughs> Excuse me, a neck. <clears throat> a bug just flew down my throat. <coughs> I apologize for that. But um, um, anyways, uh, we'll see how this goes. Um, you can see it's just about done with my autofocus routine. I'm going to pause it, and then I'll come back when the first sub comes up. Okay, my first image will be coming up here in just a few seconds, about 20 seconds. I do want to point out something to you really quick. Um, when I set up my sequence, one of the things that I did was over here, it's a little bit darkened right now because it's running it, but you'll notice on my autofocus, I have it set up so it, it, it set, does an autofocus on start, and then after an HFR increase of 10%. And so basically what happens, this will measure all of the stars in the picture and measure the HFR. If it changes by more than 10%, it will run the autofocus routine again. What I like about that is that allows me to be able to basically automate. I can go inside now and just let this thing run uh, for the rest of the night. There's one other feature I want to show you, but let's look at this picture. This looks pretty good. You can see the pinwheel galaxy right here. There's another small galaxy right over here. The stars look nice and round. If we zoom in there a little bit, we can see them even better. Um, yeah, that looks pretty good. I'm real happy with that. That's gonna, that's, I think this is going to come out pretty nicely. The other feature I wanted to show you real quick in Nina that makes this really great. I love this program. This is, uh, quickly became my favorite capture, uh, software. But let me show you one other thing that you can set up over here. And that is the auto meridian flip. You can see that in three uh, hours and 33 minutes, I will hit the meridian. And in three hours, 33 minutes, and 55 seconds, I'm going to do the meridian flip. And the way I've set that up to do it automatically is if you come over here to options and imaging, here under auto meridian flip, you can click it to enabled. Um, you can set this to however many minutes after the meridian you want it to be. I've set it for one. Um, and then you can... Um, um, uh, set, I, I didn't do this, but I have it. You, you can set it to use telescope side of the pier, recenter after flip, and then uh, scope settle time after flip. You can set all of these things and then set the autofocus. And it will, when it comes up to that time to do it, it will, it will pause, it will do the flip, it will refocus, it will recenter, it will get everything set back up. So it makes automating these imaging sessions very, very easy. That's the thing I like about Nina. You can really, once you get the sequence set up, pretty much press start and it will take care of everything for you. Now I still kind of come out and check it out every once in a while, but technically I wouldn't have to do that. Okay. Well, we will go ahead and continue to image the rest of the night. And once I get these 72 images shot, we will come back and stack them and see what we've got. Okay, let's get to the results. This is the picture that I took last April, April of 2020. This was the best picture that I had gotten so far of the Pinwheel Galaxy. This was taken over a year ago. Um, and I was really happy with this picture at the time. You can see a little bit of the spiral structure here. And this was shot with the Orion ED80T 
at its native fo focal uh, length of 480 millimeters, which is f6.0. This is the picture that I got this year. Now look at this. This is a wider field view because I'm using the 0 0.80 focal reducer, bringing this down to 384 millimeters focal length or a 4.8 uh, F ratio. And so, but I want you to notice, look how much better the stars are. That's a result of getting better guiding. I'm getting much better guiding. And I'm also shooting at a faster uh, focal length. So things uh, really came out much better in this picture. Let's get in here and talk a little bit about the details. First of all, let's kind of zoom in and look at the galaxy. Now, this is a very large galaxy in reality. Um, uh, astronomers tell us from, that its total diameter uh, from one side to the other is about 170,000 light years. That's in comparison to 105,700 light years in our own galaxy, the Milky Way. So this is a big galaxy. There are about a trillion stars in this galaxy, nearly twice as many that are in our own galaxy. And there are a large number of uh, H2 regions. You see all of these bright orange and pink areas in here? Those are areas that have high concentrations of hydrogen. These are areas where new and uh, uh, bright stars are forming. And uh, some uh, are so large that they uh, could be called giant H2 regions. And they are exceptionally, uh, inside of them, there's an exceptional number of very um, massive stars. And so that's why we get the blotchiness in this galaxy. These are areas uh, where we call a nebula in our own galaxy, uh, where new stars are being formed. You'll also notice that it's a little bit asymmetrical. Look at this arm over here. Something's jacked up about this arm. Looks like it's almost been broken off, coming off at a, you know, at a very sharp angle. And it's not very symmetrical. And the reason for that is, is that this galaxy has had a rather chaotic history. In fact, at some point, notice this little galaxy, this little blotch over here. This is actually another galaxy. This is NGC 5474, and it's the closest galaxy to the pinwheel. Now, somewhere along the line and back in their history, these two galaxies have had a run-in with one another, and the pinwheel galaxy has actually sucked off some of the, ga of the gas and you'll notice that the, the gas and the dust in this, uh, or the disk rather, in this galaxy is offset from the center, from the nucleus. It's, it's almost as if uh, part of it got chopped off. And that's as a result of the interaction between these two galaxies. If we were to zoom out um, and look, there are other galaxies in this picture, by the way. You'll see a little uh, uh, small uh, blotch up here. This is a galaxy. Up here is another one. Down here is a really kind of pretty, um, I'm not sure if this is a spiral galaxy uh, or not, but you can see a galaxy down here. Um, a very, very interesting area. One of the things that's interesting here about um, this galaxy as well, there's been a total of four supernovas discovered in M101 over the years. So this is an area that's kind of active by galactic standards for um, stars going uh, supernova and blowing up. And uh, which is kind of interesting. So, um, well, that's the M101. I think this is uh, probably the, uh, it's certainly the best picture of M101 I've gotten, but this is my favorite galaxy picture that I've taken so far. I really like this picture. Um, this was made from a total of, um, uh, just to give you the statistics on it, I shot this with my ED80 T telescope with the 0 0.80 focal reducer a um, ZWO 183 MC Pro camera on an HEQ5 uh, uh, Skywatcher mount. Uh, the, I took a total of 80 five-minute long subs, which brings me up to, I guess, around six and a half hours total imaging time. And honestly, that is, uh, I, I'm, I'm amazed by this result um, with that equipment. And so uh, I hope you learned something today. I hope you enjoyed it. 
If you did, please subscribe to my channel. And if you really liked it, share it with your friends. Help me to get the word out there. I'm trying to build my channel, trying to get more and more subscribers. And uh, But I want to do it the right way. So if you enjoyed it, share it with your friends. And uh, please subscribe. So thank you for tuning in. Next week, by the way, we're going to look at another galaxy. I'm using some different equipment. I'm using a Celestron 6 SCT. And I'm just going to give you a quick look. This is the image that I captured with it of the uh, Sunflower Galaxy. This is M63, and I shot this with a Celestron six point uh, a Celestron six inch telescope, which a lot of people say you can't do good astrophotography with, but I think you can if you spend enough time. And I'll show you how I captured this next week. So tune back in.